The passage that I would like to focus on again this morning is found in Jeremiah chapter 29. If you would please turn there with me in your Bibles. Jeremiah chapter 29. In one way or another, people make plans. They make plans for what they do. Some make detailed plans plans. Some people have apps on their phones to remind them that uh, tomorrow they have a meeting with somebody at such and such a time, at such and such a place. And then they have a detailed, comprehensive, scripted plan for that meeting. They have it all laid out and they're ready to go because they have it a plan for themselves. Others have plans to go shopping. And when they go shopping, they have lists. And they go by the lists. And they know what aisle this is on, and they know what aisle that is on. And they go by their list to purchase exactly what they have. They have a plan to go shopping. Coupons to be used in their shopping. A plan. Now, some guys, they have a plan to get something from Home Depot, and they go and wander around for an hour, and maybe they'll pick up something and probably forget what they need. But hey, it's a plan. They're going to go to Home Depot. Now, some families, they get in their car, and they know right where they're going to go. They punch it into the GPS, or they know right where they're going to go. They know where they're going to go for dinner. They know where they're going to go to visit or whatever. And they have a plan. They're on their way. Others get in the car and they say, that happens in my family a lot, where do you want to go for dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go for dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? But eventually they get somewhere because they make a plan to get there. Now, in the whole scheme of things, these involving our lives are just what we might call little plans, little things, small plans. However, there are some important people, as we would call them, who have what we might call big plans. These might involve the government. And they make plans that affect our nation. They make plans that may even affect the world. They make big plans and dictate to the peons in the country what they will do. Plans like 50% of all cars sold in America will be electric by the year 2030 because I say so. And so you have to buy electric cars. They make big plans. Many of these totalitarian atheists with ill-gotten political powers seek to rule your life and mine. And they think they do. However, the Bible tells us that there is one who does have total power over all plans. Big plans and little plans. And it is not these foolish politicians from our nation or from any other nation the ultimate maker of plans, the one whose plans will stand 100% is none other than Almighty Creator God. And today we will begin to see how this is included in the text before us, verse 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now, 
This text comes to us, as we have mentioned from the very beginning, in the midst of God's judgment upon the nation of Israel for their waywardness and their sinfulness. Following after pagan gods, following after false gods, following after false ways, and not going by the word of God, God is bringing judgment upon the land. And yet, in the midst of his judgment, he says, I have plans for you. And it could read, as it does in the King James Version, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. God thinks of you. God thinks of his people. He thinks of us. Now, in the text that he's saying, actually, in all that I do, I think of you. It's an amazing thought. In the plans, in the executing of the plans, in what I'm thinking, you are always before me. We saw from other texts that as a mercy mother, God remembers his children. Our hands are written. Our names are written on the palm of his hands. We are before him and he thinks of us. But not only does he think of us, as we saw last week, he also cares for us. It's not like he thinks about us and then does nothing about it. We are in his thoughts and he acts on our behalf. That's really the meaning of the text. That he will act, he will take action on behalf of his people. We saw last week from Matthew chapter 6 that the Father cares for man more than any other creature. He talked about how we're so much more important than the birds of the, or the fields. So much more important than any other created being. God will and does care for his people. But we also saw last Lord's Day that sometimes God's care includes discipline. God's care includes training that is sometimes painful. And we looked at a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 speaking of how God does discipline those whom he loves. It is part of his care. It is part of his plan to discipline those that he loves as any father who loves his child would discipline them. It is part of caring for them. And he disciplines and trains his church. And we have felt some of that in recent months. As a father loves his child, God loves his church. So people don't ever imagine that God has stopped caring for you when you go through a time of pain or suffering. Don't believe that God doesn't think of you anymore in the midst of a calamity. He does care for his children, and he does continue to care for us. He does think of you and care for you. Never forget, even in the midst of trials, all of the good things that God has brought to pass for us. All of the good things that God has brought to pass for you. I can remember in my own life, and I know that in some of your lives, that so many times, just when you needed his help, he provided. He intervenes to care for his children and provides for us. Just when you thought all hope was lost, he acted and did something to provide and care for you. The great saints of old, and some of the men who would pray and pray and ask for God's help in their work of being missionaries or work of running orphanages, 
would be almost out of food to feed the people. And yet they would pray. And a knock would come at the door. And food would be brought. And provision be brought for their children. Just when you think all hope is lost, God does act. You are in His thoughts. You are in His plans. You are ever before Him. Even though we know that we are unworthy, even though we know we are only deserving of His judgment, in the midst of that, He cares for and provides for us. Oh, how worthy of our praise is the God of the Bible who thinks of and cares for His people. Now with those things in mind, today I want to turn now to begin to open up this text in regards to the plans of God. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 where he says, For I know the plans that I have for you. And so today I want for us to see, or begin to see, that God has plans for us. God has plans for you. God has plans for me. God has plans for this church. Let's see what that means. And although, again, the text in the Hebrew, as we mentioned, could read, I know the thoughts that I think of you. Remember, the text actually involves in what I am doing, I think of you. In what I am doing, you are before me. So it involves his plans. It involves his workings. In all that God is doing, in all that God is working, you are in his mind. You are in his thoughts. It is an astounding statement. Hard for us to comprehend. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you should think of him? Who are we that God should think of us in all that he's doing, in all that is taking place? And yet that is what the text says. His plans involve you, and me. However, he is God. He is still God. And so the first thing we want to see from the text is that the plans are God's plans. Not always our plans. God's plans. He is the sovereign, almighty God. And so this theological principle that we're going to begin to look at here is foundational to our understanding of God and who He is. Either He as God is in control of all things or He isn't God at all. Because God controls everything. God is God. That's who God is. Sovereign, all-powerful, almighty. These are things that we see throughout the scriptures. We speak of his omnipotence. We speak of the fact that he's ever-present. That he's present everywhere. His omnipresence. We think of his power, his might, that he's in control. We think of his sovereignty. That's who God is. You take those things away from God, and you don't have God. You don't have the God of the Bible anymore. The God of the Bible is God, and He is in control of all things. I want for us to take this principle and see how it involves His plans by turning to that passage we read a little while ago in Isaiah chapter 42. If you would turn there, please. Isaiah 42. As here we see God's purposes show God to be God. His purposes, his plans, show him to be God. Now we've read this text in your hearing a little bit ago. Pick it up once again in verse 5. Thus says God the Lord. 
God who is Yahweh. The I am who I am. Now notice it says, who created the heavens. He is the God of creation. He is the God of all things. He is all powerful. There is no one or nothing else who has created all things, including you. God is a creator of you. He is the creator of all things, the heavens and the earth. It says that he stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offsprings. By the way, this verse right here is one of the verses that we turn to when we have these brilliant scientists who deny creation, who say it's impossible for the earth to only be maybe six to 10,000 years old, maybe somewhere in that area. It's impossible because the light from stars takes longer than that to reach the earth. Well, here's how it happens. God stretched out the heavens so that the light started where God created it and we're able to see it as it was stretched out by him. I digress. Who spread out the earth and its offsprings, who gives breath to the people on it. You are alive today by the will of God as he gives you breath. This atmosphere around the earth created by God to perfectly give you breath. This is God. This is the God of the Bible and a spirit to those who walk on it, a soul within us. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Don't try to bow down before an idol and call it God. It is an idol. It is dead. It is worthless. But God is God. I am the I am is really what he's saying in verse 8. And I will not give my glory to another. Now look what he says. Behold, the former things have come to pass. What former things? His creation the things that he has already talked about, the things that he has already done in the earth, his covenant with Abraham, his covenant with Moses, his covenant with David. These things have already come to pass. They have already happened. Now I declare new things before they spring forth. I proclaim them to you. And so he's saying, I am God. I will not give my glory to another. And one of the ways that you know that I am God is that I tell you things. And they happen. Just as I told you that they would. I tell you things. And I bring them to pass. Now, the new thing that he's speaking about here, one of the points of the new thing that he's speaking about right in verse 9 has to do with what he said in verse 6 and verse 7. I am the Lord and called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you and will appoint you as a covenant to the people, a light to the Gentiles. I'm going to make you to be a light to other nations, to other people. I'm going to bring out the new covenant to open blind eyes, the blind eyes of the Gentiles, 
to bring out prisoners from a, the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness. God is going to do a new thing, a wonderful thing. And this involves us. This involves the sending of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The establishment of the church. The new covenant. This is what He said would come to pass in this text. And people, this is what has come to pass. His plan will always come to pass as He decrees. He declares new things that will come to pass. And that is what happened. His son and the church. Look over just a few pages to chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. Similar and powerful language here as well. Look down to verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. This is God. Take your puny idol, or your phony pagan God, and throw them away. They cannot help you. They will not help you. There is but one God, and it is the God of the Bible. There is no God besides me. I'm sorry if it's offensive to some of these religions who worship and follow after pagan gods. They are not gods at all. They're the gods of men's work. The gods that men make with their hands. Perhaps the most prominent God, small g God in the world today and particularly in our country today is the God that people make with their mind. The God of their imagination. They imagine that God is like this or God is like that. God will never send anyone to hell. God will never judge. We think God is all love. We think God is like this. They have made God in their own image. But when you look at the Bible, God even says, there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation. And let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. What's he saying? You hear what he's saying? I am God, and I prove it by, by having declared things that have come to pass exactly as I said they would. Sometimes centuries before they have come to pass exactly as I said they would. There is no pagan God that does that. There is no one else that does that. I declare something that will happen and it comes to pass. There is nothing or no one else like God. This is how he shows who he is. This is how he shows why we can trust him and believe him. He tells the future and it comes to pass just as he said. There is no prophecy in the Quran. There is no prophecy in the Bhagavad Gita. There is no prophecy that has come to pass in any other religious book or fortune cookies. God is God. And one of the ways he says, let me show you that I am God, is by telling or prophesying things before they happen and then they come to pass 
just as he said. Now listen to me. This is unique. The Bible is unique. 700 approximately, Isaiah was written approximately 750 years prior to the birth of Christ. 750 years before Christ was born. And you don't have to take the time to look because you all know the passage. If you were to look back in the beginning of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 7, it says that a virgin will conceive and bear, bring forth a son. It goes on to say that you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And 750 years later, what happened? You all know the Christmas account. You all know what took place. You all know what we look at around the end of the year, in December, when we talk about Christmas. 750 years later, Mary, a virgin, was visited by Gabriel, an angel and told that she would bear the Christ child. Jesus, the Messiah, had to be born of a virgin. Otherwise, he would be tainted by Adam's sin. And this is exactly what happened. A virgin conceived and gave birth to the Messiah, the very Son of God. The child in you will be holy. He will be the Son of God. And that is Jesus. That happened. 750 years before, Isaiah said, and it came to pass exactly as God said it would. America hasn't even been around 750 years. We haven't even been around half that long. Think about somebody saying something when America began 200 and something years earlier that it would happen today. It's inconceivable. That's why God says, let me show you that I am God. I tell you things and they come to pass. God's plans are always 100% perfect. God's plans always happen as he says they would. If you look in the prophet Micah in chapter 5, God says, and this is, by the way, the prophet Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. Might have been a little bit younger. Might have been 735 years. But Micah also says that the Messiah would be born. And you read in Micah chapter 5 that it speaks of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. But there were two Bethlehems. So Micah says in Bethlehem, Ephrata. And that is where Jesus was born. 735 years before, the child will be born in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem of Ephrata. Now remember, Mary and Joseph were living in Galilee, Nazareth. They weren't in Bethlehem. But the Roman Caesar Augustus called for a census at just that time. A census to be taken with the people in their own cities the tribes in their own cities. And because Joseph was of the tribe of Judah and David, King David, was born in Bethlehem, Joseph had to travel from Nazareth, from Galilee, down to Bethlehem. And lo and behold, the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. Now all through the Gospels, or in, in some portions of the Gospels, the scribes and the Pharisees complain, there's no prophet that would come forth from Nazareth or from Galilee because they thought Jesus was born in Nazareth. But he wasn't. He was born in Bethlehem just where God said he would be born 735 years earlier. Earlier. Joseph, Mary, Traveled to Bethlehem 
And while they were there, the child was born. Do you think that that was an accident? Do you think that Caesar said, well, you know what? I'll have a census on his own? This was the plan of God. The prophecy of God being fulfilled just as God had intended it to be. All God's plans, all told by him prior to them coming to pass, and then coming to pass just as he said they would, show us that he is God. Show us that God's purposes come to pass. Showing us that he is the one who has the plans. You know, this also shows us that the Bible is reliable. It shows us that God is God, but it also shows us that we can trust his word because what he says comes to pass. There are no contradictions. There are no lies. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Some people find this thing here or that thing there and they think, well, ha, there's a mistake in the Bible. And yet reasonable answers are always able to be given. For thousands of years now, men have tried to prove the Bible wrong. Men have tried to find errors or mistakes. There are none. God's word is infallible. It is God's word, and it is infallible, and it is complete. No contradictions, no lies, no mistakes. You can trust it. It's God's word. Now, back to Jeremiah, chapter 29. Let's plug all of that into what we have in this text. All of the understanding that God's purposes show God to be God and that God's plans are always going to come to pass 100% as he said that they would. And let's plug that in to verse 11 as he says, I know the plans that I have for you. And now I want to focus on on the fact of him knowing the plans. I know the designs that I am designing for you. The emphasis is on him knowing. He knows this. Okay, look at the text again. I know the plans that I have for you. And what I want for us to notice in the text is the absence of you knowing the plans. It doesn't say that you will know the plans. It says that God knows the plans. I know the plans that I have for you. Sometimes we don't know the plans that God has. He knows, not always us. I want to point out another text back in Isaiah. Not quite as far back. If you would look at chapter 55, Isaiah 55. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Isaiah 55. Pick up the reading in verse 6 of Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let them return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as, heaven, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
His thoughts are not always our thoughts. His thoughts are not always what we think they should be. And I would also point out that the word thoughts in verse 8 is the same word that Jeremiah uses in Jeremiah 29.11 when it speaks of his thoughts or his thinking of us. His thoughts, his plans are not always what we would want, what we would expect, or what we wind up with. We are not God. We are not equal to God. We are not on the same level as God. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are much higher, much greater. His ways are not our ways. They are much greater. Now, that's not to say that we don't understand his ways and some of his thoughts. We'll talk about that in a moment. But here we're seeing the whole matter of God's plans for our lives. We don't know the plans. God does. His plans, his thoughts, even if they are for us, are far above what our puny minds can conceive of. He is sovereign. He is almighty. How can men possibly say that they know the thoughts of God? We have these TV showmen who claim to be prophets or Christian teachers. And they say, I know the mind of God. Or they have some that say, God told me. What arrogance. If God is telling them something, it would be in the Bible. Because that's revelation from God. We have God's revelation. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. His ways much higher than our ways. The text even says in verse 9, For as high as the heavens are above, that's how much higher his thoughts are. They just shot a rocket up the other day. Takes a day to get up to the space station. Days to get to the moon. Days and days and months to get to some place like Mars. So much higher than our ways. So much higher than our thoughts. Here in this passage, I want you to see the context as well, that he's calling on men to turn away from their own thinking. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. Forsake your way and turn to the Lord's way. His way. Repentance. Calling upon men to turn from their own thoughts and their own ways to the thinking and the ways of God in the Bible. Now back to Jeremiah 29 and use that again as we consider what he says here in the text. The plans belong to God. I know the plans that I have for you, declares Jehovah God. I know the plans that I have for you. They are his plans. Right here, we're talking about this in the midst of Israel being judged by God. We read the final chapter of Jeremiah a little while ago, Daniel in the reading. And it talked about how the nation was taken captive to Babylon. It talked about how some of the elders were put to death and the kings were taken captive. They were taken captive as God's judgment against their sin. Do you think Israel thought that was a good thing? Do you think that was one of the highlights of their time? Do you think they were happy about being taken captive by Babylon? They did not like it. It was not fun. Ezekiel talks about some of this as well. 
and what took place when they were taken captive. It was a hard and a difficult time. Do you think that they thought it was for their good? And yet overall in the plan of God, He was chastening them, training them, and allowing a remnant to come back and to later on establish the rebuilding of the temple again in uh, the time approximately 400 years prior to the birth of Christ. And they reestablished the nation of Israel there. And who came from that? Jesus. They were reestablished, they were chastened, they were chastised, and they were reestablished, rebuilt the, the new temple, and then, of course, the temple in Jesus' day was undergoing rever uh, renovations by Herod. They did not think that this was for their good, but God did it for their good. It was ultimately for their good. You remember Job, what Job went through, how he lost his children, all of his children. He became sick and ill with boils all over his body, in pain and agony. Do you think Job thought that was for his good? His friends didn't think so. His friends thought that it was because he was a sinner, his comforters. But God comes to him at the end and tells him that he had done this for his good. And he established him with more children and was even more wealthy than when the ordeal began. At this time, we have seen some bad things happen to our families and to our church. And we may not and do not necessarily understand. We may not think that this is for our good. We certainly do not understand. But we have seen these things happen. And we must embrace the fact that God has a plan for our good. You look back in your life, you lose a job, you think it's the end of the world. You miss a plane, you miss an appointment, you think it's done. You lose a friend and it hurts so bad. You don't understand. Why would God do this? He says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans. You don't always know the plan. We don't always understand. But we must trust that He knows the plan. The plans belong to God not to us. But with that said, I just want to close this morning by making sure that we understand that there are many of God's plans which are clear as they are given to us in the Bible. Many of God's plans are clear. He has laid out for us some things that are simple and unmistakable and clear. One example, his plan of redemption. Look at John 3.16. A verse so quoted and so clear. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In that verse, we see that men are perishing. They need a Savior. 
And God so loved the world that he gave his son to be that savior. And what do you do to not perish in hell? Those who believe in him shall not perish. Believe in him. That's simple. That's very simple and very plain. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have eternal life. Believe in Christ and you will never die. We see that in John chapter 11, but we also see in John chapter 14 how Jesus clearly says in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. What is God's plan of redemption? God's plan of redemption is that you believe in Christ and you come to the Father through Jesus. It's clear. That's his plan of redemption. Sending his son to die on the cross to save you from your sin. Believe in him and you have eternal life. And he is the only way. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. There's no other way. No other way. He is the only way to God, the only way to salvation. Not church, not decisions made in church, not your own thoughts and your own ways. Through Christ, he makes dead men to live. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over sins previously committed. With the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at this present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You want to be just? You want to be saved? You want to go to heaven? You have faith in Jesus. The plan of redemption in the Bible is clear. We may not always understand how God works it out in our lives. But the plan of God is given to us in his word. His plan is through Christ and through the proclamation of the gospel as well. If you would, still in the book of uh, John, look over to the book of Romans. Still in the book of Romans, credit. Look over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 13. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's simple. That's clear. That's a plan you can all understand. And it's plan of proclamation for the truth. Right here in the same chapter, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The preaching of the word of Christ. The preaching of of the Bible, the preaching of the gospel through the preaching of his word. And his plan of evangelism is right there. Go forth and proclaim and be my witnesses. This is the plan of God's redemption for his people. Plain and understandable for all. Yes, we don't always know the plans of God in our life, but some of his plans are very clear. Men are to repent, to turn from their sins, and to come to Christ. That is the way of salvation. I encourage you to be saved today. 
to come to Christ today. It's simple. It's clear. It's right in the Bible for you. We'll look into His plans for us and what that means more next Lord's Day. But this Lord's Day, please see, the plan of redemption is clear and easily known. Come to faith in Christ and be saved. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you again today, we are thankful for Christ. Thank you for your plan of redemption that it is so clear and so easy to understand. And as we continue to study and to learn more regarding the plans that you have for us in our lives, we pray that we would more and more depend upon you depend upon your power, your might, and the goodness that you have in store for us. Help us to trust you even today, God, to believe that you have a way for us that is right, good, and perfect. Hear our prayers this morning. Hear our prayers today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.